How's it going? Um, my name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm glad to be with you this morning as we continue in this teaching series, For God's Sake, Grow Up. Um, now, for some of you who are joining us for the first time, you're like, that's a little salty for church, right? Welcome. Um, the reason that we're, we're in this teaching series, and it's got sort of a tongue-in-cheek title, is because we must be, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, we must be partners with God in our own growth. We tend to think about our moral development or our emotional development or our faith development as something like God is going to do externally to us, which is part of the truth. But we are asking the question in this teaching series, how do we participate with God in our own growth? Because the reality is, if we don't grow up, God gets far less glory out of our lives than he deserves, and we are far less useful to our friends and family and neighbors who need us to look increasingly more like Jesus. So if you're a Christian in here today and you're like, oh, how do I, I'm, I'm thinking about you know, all of these issues I'm struggling with or this emotional stuff or these habits I need to, to break, well, then that, that's, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about today. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus in here today, I want you to listen specifically for this because you've probably bumped into a Christian either on social media or in real life or somewhere down the line where you thought, well, that person is a hypocrite. And you might be right. And so what this teaching series is designed to help us do, for those of you who are followers of Jesus, is help you grow up quite literally for the sake of the Lord. And for those of you who aren't yet followers of Jesus, know that we take that really, really seriously. So, join me, if you will, in standing and reciting our memory verse. Anybody, you probably got this by now. Was there an audible groan? Did I hear one of you groan? <laughs> for God's sake, get up. Let's go. All right, groan, you're just going to make me angry. Here we go. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, sorry. Let those of us who are mature think this way. So, you may be seated. Let those of us who are mature think this way. Today's teaching comes out of Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, particularly about the thoughts we think. Our first, te- our first week we were, we were looking at time and how we have to grow up in wisdom so that we can grow up with our use of time. This week we're going to be thinking about what we think about and how we have to grow up with regard to the thoughts we allow to take root in our minds. So, 2 Corinthians 10 starting in verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we're going to need your help today. God, there are strongholds of ideas and thoughts that exist in our culture that have our minds captive. Some of my friends in here, their their thinking is imprisoned in a stronghold from which you wish to free them. Me too. So Father, I'm asking you to send the Holy Spirit, help us demolish these strongholds and help us think your thoughts about the world and ourselves and feel your feelings about the world and ourselves so that we can grow up for your sake. 
Amen. Pastor Donnie and I have many things in common. We're both dudes, we're both from Florida, we both love Jesus. But one thing that we, we also hold in common is we both really, really hate lies. Hate him, hate, hate being lied to, hate the effects of lies. I remember sitting in, uh, in my house in Scotland before we moved back to America to plant this church, thinking about, God, what do you, what do you want to call this thing? And, um, and because I was a second-year Greek student, I thought, well, let's use a Greek word no one knows. You can laugh. It's okay. And, and the word aletheia came to mind because the word aletheia means truth. And, man, it really felt animated in my soul because so many of the universities around here have the word truth or light or something like that, knowledge, you know, emblazoned upon something made of limestone that would be too expensive to replace, even though very few of them believe such things even exist anymore. And so I thought, well, Lord, if you're sending us to Boston to to plant churches, send us with the truth because lies imprison people. And when you begin to believe things that do not accord with reality, then your life will not accord with reality and there will be a disjunction. And so that's kind of the animating thought behind the word aletheia. But the word aletheia is sort of a special word, and now I'm going to nerd out for you just a little bit. One woo, one woo. <laughs> Hundreds of you, one woo. Okay. Uh, well, just for you, brother. Um, the, the word aletheia, is, is a, is, it literally means that which is no longer hidden. For those of you who are English language fans, there's this thing called the alpha privative, which negates the rest of the things that come after the alpha or the A in English. And that's what this word does. It says not hidden, that, that which is revealed, that which has been unveiled, just like the scripture we read earlier today during worship, that, that in Christ, the veil has been taken off, that there's something God has to do to open our eyes, to take off the blinders so that we can see the world as it actually is, and therefore know how we are to be in it, know how we are to live in it. So truth really matters, but not just true propositions, not, not just true thoughts, True feelings. Now, already some of you are like, well, I feel like that's not true. (laughs) Our emotional problems very often, not all the time, but very often come from deeply held beliefs that are simply false. Deeply held beliefs that are false about ourselves. Deeply held beliefs that are false about the world. And when those Deeply held beliefs get so, so buried into your marrow, into your soul. Pretty soon your emotional life can get a little wonky too. So true things, true thoughts, and true feelings matter. And if we're going to grow up, then we have to start thinking how God thinks and feeling how he feels. If we are going to grow up as people, we've got to start thinking how God thinks And feeling how he feels. I remember the first time I heard someone pray, God, I want to feel your emotions about something. And I was like, hmm? Can can he do that? I just didn't even think like that was a thing. Because I've been bathed in this culture that says my feelings are this inviolable thing that simply exists. And very little can be done to change them. In fact, it might be wrong to change them. We just have to come into contact with them and then live in response to them. But what I heard that guy pray was that somehow God can begin to help shape my inner life after his inner life. And I haven't stopped praying that prayer since. Here, in this particular text, I think God wants to show us how we can, for his sake, begin to grow up with regard to our thoughts and feelings. And this is extremely important for us because very many of you who are Christians come to a church like this and you get your spiritual stuff done. Check. But then you get on social media or you get on your MSNBC or Fox News or your favorite commentator or your podcast or something and you let that thing sort of shape your worldview. And then you come over here in your relationships and sort of you look at your inner life and what you feel, you know, drawn to or not drawn to and that's sort of how you think about relationships. But Jesus is over here in your spiritual life and everything else is compartmentalized. And that's not the way Christians are supposed to be. We are supposed to allow the lordship 
and the leadership of Jesus to wash into every part of our lives, how we think, how we feel, how we act. Now, that process takes a while, but it'll never happen if we don't participate with it, right? And so if you want to grow up in God, man, you've got to start thinking how he thinks and feeling how he feels. And I think that's precisely what Paul is doing here. Now, just a little background on Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians was written in response to a letter Corinth wrote to Paul. So, dear Paul, we're kind of messing things up. Help, please. And Paul says, dear, well, no, dear, actually, he just, he, he dictated it to another guy because Paul had bad eyesight and drew in giant letters. So, it's true. So, dear Corinthians, um, you know, here, here are your thoughts, or, you know, my thoughts on what, you, you know, your letter said. And they, they read this, and, oh, that's pretty good. We have more questions. Dear Paul, right? And Paul writes back, and that's the book of 2 Corinthians. And in, in this book, what he is dealing with is, is helping this new church that was filled with the Holy Spirit, that was very young, that was growing rapidly, that was made of many different ethnicities and, and religious backgrounds, try to figure out how to live like Christians. Now, that means it's very applicable to us, because I don't know if you've seen the room, but we're not all the same. We are growing, and many of us are young. So, it would do us well to put our ear to what Paul is saying here, how we grow up by thinking God's thoughts and by feeling his emotions. So let me just read this again. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take, captive ev- uh, okay, take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So one of the things that's controlling what Paul's saying right here is this militaristic metaphor. This, this militaristic metaphor. He's talking about something like a stronghold. And me, as a giant nerd, when I hear the word stronghold, I think of this. Who knows what that is? I'm sorry, what Christians are there in the room? <laughs> this, is, this is Helm's Deep from, from the second Lord of the Rings book, and if you don't know that, it's okay. There's mercy and grace for you too. Put the Netflix down, open the book up, all right? And if you're like, I don't like to read. Okay, just watch the four and a half hour long movie. Um, it's the second one. All right, so Helm's Deep is this giant stronghold that uh, when, when, this, when um, the uh, kingdom of Rohan was under attack, they would all run in there, so that all the bad guys couldn't get him. But when Paul's thinking about destroying strongholds, this is kind of what's in his mind. He's thinking about Roman imperial soldiers going and conquering the world, and when they get to a city and they start to win, everybody goes into the city stronghold, which most major cities in the ancient world had one of these, and getting people out of that was really, really, really hard. It could take a long, long siege. It could take a long, long time. And that's what Paul is saying, bringing bad ideas down down is like. Now you're saying, well, where do these strongholds live? See, very often this text is used to talk, like, like we read, oh, we need to take every thought captive and like wage uh, war against these strongholds in our lives. No. This is not talking about something in you, at least not in you to start with. He's talking about ideas that are culturally prevalent, that are so rooted that it feels like being out of agreement with them is like Scaling a wall of a stronghold. The metaphor here is really, really important because our culture right now has some really terrible ideological strongholds that if you don't see them, then your thoughts will remain captive in them. Now, I'm going to name a few, and as I name a few, I'm going to offend some of you. I tried to be selective so that I would offend all of you because I love you, so let's see. Here's one, our current culturally progressive view on sex and social ethics. Oh, got everyone's attention. In the history of human cultures, we're the first people, the first people, to locate sexual ethics in the individual's feelings and self-perceptions. Now, do you feel that uncomfortable tension in the room right now? Where everyone's going, why is he talking about that? We're not allowed to talk about that. That's how you know we're talking about a stronghold. Because coming against it feels like, 
uh, no, change the channel, change the channel. Rapture now, Jesus rapture now, right? <laughs> like, no, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about this. Yeah. Ah. I get it. I totally get it. I, I'm, I know we're going to get emails on that one. Like, I get it. But that is a current cultural stronghold. Here's how you know it's a cultural stronghold and not just this inviolable truth. Because if you and I all got on an airplane today and flew to Moscow, their sexual ethic is totally different. And then if we got back on the same airplane and flew to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, their sexual ethic is totally different. And you say, well, but we're a progressive, enlightened culture. Well, how very uh, culturally elite of you right? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, right. No, this isn't rooted in truth. It's rooted in a current cultural moment. But coming against it feels like coming against Hel- Helm's Deep with a water pistol. How about this one? Transactional views on human life. The idea that what we are is like units of economic production. Conservatives and liberals do this to each other. Right? We just argue about how best to extract value from a human life. You know, is it more government, government invention or less? Is it more freedoms or less freedoms? Is it, eh, eh. But the idea is that humans are transactionally valuable. That's why we feel okay in progressive societies to think about, like, euthanasia. Oh, well, that person has lost their usefulness, you see. Or the thing that we talked about last week, you know, the, the killing of the young. They're very, I mean, I have many of the young people, they're very expensive, (laughs) especially when they get braces. Amen? Amen. (laughs) But if we just view one another as units of economic power or production, that's unbiblical and ungodly. But try to go into your next public policy class and say something like, I think humans are made in the image of God, and so they're worth more than just what they can contribute to an economy. Everyone will be like, weirdo, you know? Yeah, here's another one. Here's another stronghold, reactionary ethnocentrism. The most common version of this right now is the alt-right. Blah. Like, e- ethnic, e- ethnocentrism of any kind is a violation of God's vision of the heavenly kingdom, because I don't know if you know this, but God's heavenly kingdom as it's shown to us in the book of revelation is one from every tribe and tongue and people and nation and so any worldview that says well but these are the most developed color kind is in direct contradiction to the gospel but this has grown up in all kinds of weird little places in america right now and it grows up in different versions in different societies destroying it it's hard Here, another one, for those of you who aren't yet offended. Here we go. The value of money and power. This is a little bit like the second one, but the way we think about money as the ultimate goal of life, or as power as the ultimate goal of life, or if you're particularly from that intersectional crew, the accrual of power is the ultimate evil. Hegemonic power is what's truly wrong with the world. I don't know if you know this, but God has all hegemonic power. But when we... we, either overvalue or undervalue these two things, we miss God, and our worldview will be out of sync. And finally, politics as religion. Uh, If you want to go to the church of politics as religion, just join Twitter, and you will be taught how to worship. Um, Yeah, we are tuning up for another election season, and every election season, it's apocryphal, right? So if this is the most important election of our lives, and if we're, then we're just going to go, and, and that's all it is, and that's all it's going to be. Here, I just ruined cable news for you for the next 13 months. You're welcome. <laughs> we're going to spend three and a half billion dollars as a society. No one will be lifted out of poverty, and everything will stay roughly the same. So now that I've sufficiently illustrated a few strongholds, what's the Bible say about how we can begin to think God's thoughts and feel his feelings? Okay. Well, first thing we have to see is in verse 4. 
In verse 4, it says very clearly, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. Look at me. Some of you were really animated by some of those strongholds. You're like, oh, I hate that one. I hate that one. That's why we have to vote for the... No, stop before you do that. Just time out. Let's make some space between I hate that one and this is what I should go do. Because what we just read in our very own Holy Bible, written by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, is that the weapons of our warfare, our being Christians, not our being conservatives or our being progressives or our being white people or our being not white, like our being these people that Jesus has saved, the weapons of our warfare are not weapons of flesh and blood. What's that mean? It means the way the church tears down strongholds is not primarily through the accrual of power, cultural capital, spending a lot of money, getting really angry, going on Facebook rants, shooting up places, none of that. That's not how we do the tearing down of strongholds. That's how the world does tearing down of strongholds. Do do you see that? That's not how God's people are to tear down bad bad ideas, by suppressing the people who have them. Our goal is not to suppress people who have bad ideas, it's to win people who have bad ideas with the gospel of Jesus and the love of God. That's our goal. So when you find someone who has a belief, whose, whose thoughts are captive to a stronghold that you just hate, you can't hate them if you love Jesus. You must be very careful. It is very, very, very hard to maintain a righteous indignation toward lies and a loving, soft heart toward the liar. It's very hard. Jesus went to the cross to do that. So, we must first primarily see that our weapons are not weapons of flesh and blood. We're not going to be vigilantes. We're not going to be violent. We're not going to shut down people. We're not going to shout down people. That's not what we do because our weapons are not primarily weapons of flesh and blood. But our weapons do somehow, according to verse 4, have divine power to destroy these strongholds. So we defeat people's thinking with the thinking of God and we defeat false feeling with God's heart towards stuff. But that begs the question, like, all right, well, how do we do it? Well, good thing the apostle didn't stop talking. Verse 5 says this. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought oh, take every thought captive oh, that is uh, to obey Christ. So here's here's what that looks like. So get that get that metaphor back in your head. This this militaristic metaphor. Here's a really bad idea in the culture. Just pick one of those five. And it it looks like Helm's Deep, man. It looks like a stronghold. It looks like impossible to scale with the weapons of the culture can't get in there. And inside there are are human souls and human minds and human lives. In fact, some of your minds are in there. How the heck do we get them out? How do we free Christian minds and then the world's minds from these ideas that are going to not bring about human flourishing and they're going to not help you grow up in God. How do we do that? In order to take every thought captive, we've got to figure out how to defeat these strongholds. And the way we defeat these strongholds is with this divine power. So here's what it is. Truth, that is God's thoughts about stuff, and grace, God's heart toward us in Christ, are the spirit-empowered weapons of our warfare. Say this again. This is why we're so into the truth and the grace and the changing power of the gospel, because those are our weapons. That's it. That's all we got. What God thinks and how God feels toward us, his his disposition toward us, are the spirit-empowered weapons of our warfare. And and when we win, when strongholds begin to be torn down, it it starts to look like this a little bit. This a little bit. Picture, the other picture? Yes. (laughs) Yes. This is... This is an artistic rendering of the captivity of Israel when the southern kingdom of Judah was captured by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And what it is, is a picture of people whose stronghold had finally been broken down, being carried off into captivity, into Babylon. Now, maybe you're sitting there thinking, I don't want my thoughts to be carried off into captivity in Babylon. 
How do I stop that? Well, this is a really bad scene if it's Babylon who's conquering the stronghold. But if it's King Jesus who's conquering the stronghold, this is really good news. Because the other version of this is the story of the Exodus. The story of God's people being kept in a kingdom under a false king who was abusing them, who was destroying them. And then even some of those captives thought life was good there, as we found out later when they were wandering around the desert. When God comes to mercifully free us from wrong thinking and wrong feeling, then we're no longer captive in the stronghold. We're being led out in freedom. Captives fleeing is what happens when we come against a bad idea, a wrong ethic, a poor view of human um, social institutions or something like that with the truth of the gospel and the grace of the gospel. It leads to fundamental life change. That's what happens. Now, Some of you are like, okay, pastor, when you said we were going to talk about thoughts, I kind of thought you were going to talk about the thoughts in my head or the feelings in my head. We are, but do you see how utterly controlled your thoughts and feelings often are by the cultural strongholds out there? Because your hearts will be captive to them. So will mine. If I have a wrong view on social ethics, or if I have a wrong view on what a human is, or I have a wrong view on money, then those things are defining success and failure for me. So if I fail at gaining more money, since our culture says that having money and having power is the way to have a good life, if I fail at that, then I failed at life. That pursuit, just that one pursuit, destroys lives. It destroys lives on both ends, because if you never have enough, you're never happy, and once you get enough guess what? It doesn't impart happiness to you. So by coming against that idea with the truth that money is a very important tool but a very terrible God and the grace that God loves people whose hearts are captive to money and wants to forgive them and give them something more valuable than money, once that person begins to believe that, that person is freed from the love of money. Do you see how that works? Here's the very important thing to understand about this. Strongholds according to verse 5, which exist out there, affect our thoughts and feelings and emotions that are in here. And so by allowing the truth of the gospel and the grace of the gospel to wash over those things, then we become truly free. Strongholds, however, are never ever defeated by your feelings or by your opinions or by personal private revelation. Look at me. Your feelings won't free you from these cultural Strongholds, they just won't. You're like, but I feel very strongly. Great, here's a lollipop. It still won't help you walk out of Helm's Deep with your head on. Private revelation, the Lord showed me. I don't care what you think the Lord showed you if you're not familiar with what he's already showed you. Can I just give that to you? Many of you are very spiritual and you hear the Lord. I believe you hear something. But the scripture says, test everything that you hear against this. And if you don't know this, then you'll be led around by every demonic spirit that can whisper into your ear. Some of that might be Jesus. Some of that might be your lunch. Others of that is definitely not people who love and follow Jesus. So you're like, well, I feel really spiritual. And I was, you know, watching a Christian-ish show. And I was listening to music. And I was all, hmm. So therefore, like, that's not how it works. I believe that the Lord speaks to us. I really, 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 really do. I just think we should probably be as or more interested in what he's already spoken to us than what we are in what he is currently speaking to us. So, for Paul, this was a really big deal because he completes his metaphor like this, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. You're like, this sounds terrible. This is a terrible sermon, Pastor Adam. This is not encouraging. I don't like militaristic metaphors. I don't want to live in a stronghold. I don't want to be captive to anybody. And why is it good news to be captive to Christ? Here's why. You're going to serve someone. And I think the devil's, man, he's brilliant. The most brilliant lie he's given to Western civilization is that you can be your own master. The best way to keep someone in captivity is to convince them that they're not. So most of us think, oh, I'm just following my heart or I'm following my dreams or I'm an independent thinker. Do you know our best cognitive research right now suggests that most of us don't have hardly any independent thoughts that were led around by our inner lives and our experiences like an elephant just lumbers through life. You're like, well, 
I thought that, no. <laughs> like we're a product of so many different things. Not to mention the captivity that our hearts experience under sin. So coming under the Lordship of Jesus is profoundly good news because he's the only one good enough that we can trust fully to have good ideas that are going to lead us to our good and not to our evil. And he's the only one kind enough to forgive us when we have bad ideas that destroy us and ourselves and welcome us back into his family. So now, all of this begs a giant question. If it's true that to grow up in God, we've got to start thinking what he thinks and feeling what he feels, how in the world do you do that? You're like, great, I agree. Let us pray. Like, that doesn't help. Like, I will think about how to think about God's thoughts. Thank you. No, I, I want to I show you a little bit. The first step is to name the thought. Like, just name it. Put, a, put your finger on, like, what, what is the stronghold that has my heart? Some of you, th those five things, you're like, oh, man, I didn't realize the Bible had something to say about sexual ethics that I still had to listen to. I just thought it was all cultural Sweep it under the cultural rug. I don't have to do that. Like, what is it that has you captive? You've got to name the thought. Is it external? Is it, is it something out there that's looking really, really attractive in the world? Or is it, is it internal? Do you, do you see right now that you're captive to like an internal thought? Like maybe fear or self-loathing or these depressive, anxious tendencies that so many of us around here are given to. You've got to name it. And, and, and it would be helpful if you could ask yourself prayerfully, where in the world is that coming from? Like, is your, is your negative emotion about yourself really coming from a deeply, deeply held lie that you're not worth loving or that no one really cares for you or that God has abandoned you? None of those things are true. But if those lies are deep in your marrow, then you'll live incongruent with reality. Trust me, some of those lies have been deep in my marrow. Got to name it. The second thing you've got to do is learn what the Bible actually says. That means not going on YouTube and shopping around for someone with a Bible degree who agrees with what you already think. Those are not the same things. You've got to learn what the Bible actually says about something. Now, what does that mean? It means studying it, but at least means believing 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 4, who, which, which tell us about how there, there's going to be a time that's coming, in fact, it's already here, where people won't endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Guys, if that was true 1,970 years ago, it's true now. I mean, I could, I could quote books and teachers to you that have Bible degrees and call themselves Christians that teach things that would break the heart of God. It means opening up the scriptures and, and learning them. And part of what that means is uh, confessing the scriptures, studying the Bible yourself, meditating on it. Here's the thing. If I am the only dispensation of biblical knowledge you experience in the week, that's not good for you because I am not perfect I don't get it right all the time. So I, e even the pastor of this church, I've got to work in biblical community. I have elders who are totally allowed to correct me. I have a pastor. Like, I have, I have professors and other Bible guys who interact with me, who are allowed to push back on me. I've invited that to them because I know I can't see everything clearly. That's what we need each other. We need to be in spiritual family so that we understand God's book correctly. Now, that might also mean like reading some other books written by really godly people on like a biblical worldview. Here's three. Like picking up a book. Like, well, what does the Bible say about how I should think about things? These are three really good books. I would start with Packer. Everything Packer's written is really good. So read your Bible and then read everything J.I. Packer's written. <laughs> Even like things he would write on a napkin. Just read it. And the most practical thing you can do is, like, get in a group, man. Get in the class. You're like, the Bible's a very big book. I don't know how to read it. We have an app for that. <laughs> to quote a really, really old Apple advertisement, we have, we have the ability to help you with that. But only if you want the help. Because, see, at this point, you've got to decide, do you want to come to church or do you want to come to Christ? 
Because if you want to come to church, you can show up as much as you want. You can put on a t-shirt, you can volunteer, you can tip God in the bucket when it goes by, and you can feel self-righteous and then hold in your head and hold in your heart beliefs and thoughts that are totally antithetical to the way God thinks and feels about things. You are free to do that, and I can't really change that for you because I can't check your mind at the door. But if you want to follow Christ, it starts by coming to the church, to coming to God's people, and then following Christ with his people. But we need each other to do that. I need you, and you need me, and y'all need each other, even those people. The third step is you've got to confess wrong thoughts and feelings that must fall. They must fall. You see, Paul's analogy about, about scaling Helm's Deep works like this. If, God, there's any thought that's resonating in my mind that's built, that's captive in some cultural stronghold, destroy it and free me. Even the thoughts I really, really love to think. Here's the thing about humans. Most of us think that we're right most of the time. But it can't, that, that can't possibly be true. Now, I know, our culture comes to say something really soothing like, well, maybe that's your truth. They just, I mean, you guys go to really important schools around here, so I just want to scream when one of you says a phrase like your truth, because the nature of something called truth is that it is not the possession of me or you. It is there for us to discover, not mine, to just look inward and go, well, my truth, those are called your feelings, your thoughts, your emotions, but then there's truth. And a personal pronoun, possessive personal pronoun, should never precede the word truth, because it's true. It's like saying, well, that's my sun up in the sky. It's mine. It's mine. Nope, it's lighting all of us. And it's burning some of us who are extremely white. I know, some of you are like, Adam's in short sleeves, and whoa, that brother's white. Yes, yes, yes. His shirt is darker than his arms, I know. My glorified body will be slightly more bronze, I'm, con- I'm sure of it. Taller, more hair. I'm putting in an order. It's like ordering a Tesla. <laughs> Some of you believe that because you've not read your Bible. Do you see? Some of you are like, oh, how you? <laughs> right now. You're like, is that how it works? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's totally how it works. Uh, yeah, while you're at it, it's, it's $1,000 just to me. I'll teach you how to do it. Help me pay for those braces. You've got to confess wrong thoughts and feelings that must fall. Once you read your Bible and you're like, I think some of my political beliefs, I think some of my sexual beliefs, I think some of my economic beliefs, I think some of my personal feelings might not be in congruence with God's word, then at that point you've got to say, Lord, be Lord. God, be God over my thoughts. We submit everything we think, all of our ideas, all of our worldview, all of our viewpoints to God. Now, some of you are like, yeah, but sometimes, Pastor Adam, you don't sound totally like Jesus. I know. Do you see how important it is that I do this too? We, we must all do this. We're not ever going to do it perfectly, but just because God's followers don't perfectly embody the Savior doesn't mean the Savior was wrong. It just means we actually needed him. Five, I'm sorry, four. You've got to begin to confess that God's thoughts are good and good for you. That God, it's really hard for me to believe right now that what you say about the body is good or what you say about my soul is good or what you say about money or what you say about those people I kind of hate are good. But Lord, I'm choosing to trust you even when it doesn't feel true. I know you are truth. You've got to begin, that, that's what it means to take every thought captive to Christ, because he's the only one worth being captive to. And five, you've got to ask the Holy Spirit for power to change. Paul says the weapon of our warfare is not weapons of flesh, but it does have divine power. In other words, he's tearing down arguments and God belittling ideas, but he's not doing it with other arguments merely. He's doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. The truth of God's word, the grace of God's heart in the gospel, empowered by the Spirit, can change everything around us. This is the divine power that we need. And the cool thing about following Jesus is that Not only has he shown us how this can be possible, but that Jesus is building a kingdom where one day there will be no strongholds 
built as lies. There will be no strongholds that are wrong, that are holding people captive. One day, he will set every captive free. Did not Jesus say, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free? That's because when we believe lies, we are in bondage. We are in strongholds. We are enslaved to a false master. But when Jesus died and he rose, he conquered death. He knocked down the door to every stronghold. He broke down every wall, and he gave you and I the Holy Spirit in his ascension and in Pentecost so that we would, as he said in the Gospel of John, be led into all truth so that we would know the difference between something godly that God built and something ungodly that man built. We'd be able to see the difference between the city of God and the city of man, and slowly, bit by bit, day by day, from glory to glory, strength to strength, we would be transformed not after the image of our own likeness or our own thoughts or our own feelings, but after the image and likeness of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That will never happen if I don't submit every square inch of my mind and my heart to the Lordship of Jesus, even when I don't want to. Now, some of you we're like, well, what do I do if I'm wrong? Well, look, you're wrong about something. And if you don't think you're wrong, just get married, and then you'll be made aware. Amen. I mean, baby, I've been made aware. Obviously, you've, I, you know. No, um, no we're, we're wrong. But the cool thing about following Jesus is that he's got power to change us and grace to forgive us. That's why it's not just truth. Where we truth, you know, true, 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 true. And you don't go on Facebook going, I'm just going to correct the internet and then everything will be fine. <laughs> that never works. Lobbing a truth grenade is not going to help anybody. But neither is it going to help anybody just be like, grace, 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 just come on in here. We just all beliefs, our beliefs, we celebrate everything. We're super inclusive except for the people that we don't wish to include because they're not as inclusive as us. Come on, come on. That doesn't work either. That just alienates the other half of people who disagree with you. But if you... Put truth out with God's heart, empowered by the Spirit. We have power to change and grace to be forgiven. So, back to Helm's Deep. What does that represent for you? Where are your thoughts captive to some form of thinking, to some feeling? It isn't godly. And what are you going to do about it? 